this evening's topic is um, form-based codes. And uh, I asked my friend Dan Tasman of Ithaca, New York uh, to come and speak to us uh, this evening. I'm just gonna read a little bit about, about Dan. Dan is a planner for the town of Ithaca, which is in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. He's a self-admitted planning nerd, yes he is, and proud native of Buffalo, New York, where his childhood surroundings in a dense, diverse urban neighborhood sparked his interest in planning and the built environment. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in urban planning from Buffalo State. I almost said Buff State. Yeah, Buff, what, Buff right? State. Buff State. Buff State. Yeah. I know. I almost said that. And Master of Urban Planning degree from the University of Buffalo. He worked in a variety of current and long-range planning roles in local governments in New Mexico, Colorado, Florida, Ohio, and Texas before returning to New York in 2009. He authored several comprehensive plans and plain English land use codes, including an award-winning unified development code for a fast-growing suburb of Boston. He co-wrote the Town of Ithaca's comprehensive plan and is the primary author of the New Neighborhood Code, a form-based zoning code that is considers some of the planning challenges that are unique to the area and the Northeast. He's also the founder of Cyberbia in 1994, which is an online community for planners and others who are interested in the built environment. When he's not thinking of ways to make better places or at home with Deb, his wife and the three cats, you might find him sweeping and throwing rocks at the local curling club. So thank you, Dan, for being here and taking a break from watching the curling at the Olympics. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Okay, for, let's see. I know we've got a, a couple of attendees here. I know more people are probably going to watch later on, watch by video. So I'm going to do that whole awkward shuffle here before I share, try to share the screen, um, get to a little presentation. I promise it's not going to be anything that's terribly boring. I'm not into the whole... No the whole boring PowerPoint. Okay, here's a slide. I'm going to read everything on it word for word. And, eh. you know, don't have a much, much of a script to go by. So you might he hear a few ahs or haws, but going to try to stop, explain everything a little bit. Uh, one thing is that this is just give you a taste of form-based zoning because um, there's a lot that you have to say that form-based zoning, there's, um, I can't describe absolutely everything about it in a 20-minute presentation, but hopefully this will pique your interest and get you started. Um, start exploring for yourself. Uh, let's see if I can share just a minute and view. Da, 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 da. Okay, and... I go over here and let's get this shared. And here we go. Okay. This is talk about what we call, you know, form based zoning, Town of Ithaca. It's our alternative zoning code. And this minute here. So think, you know, let's talk about zoning 101. I think most of the people who are watching this are going to know the reasons why we have zoning. Um, came about is kind of a progressive era reform back in the 1910s, 1920s. And the whole idea was to kind of prevent situations where one person ruins it for everybody else. Um, early urban planning conferences, um, when they promoted zoning, whole idea was that it protected lower income property owners who might have spent their life savings to buy their first house, but they were also in areas that were ideally suited for factories and other nuisance uses. So you'd have a factory pop up and there goes their life savings. Um, also, it gave a community you know, the legal structure to implement a comprehensive plan. There were community plans before, but there really wasn't any way to legally implement them. Um, sure, city could have built roads in a certain place, but 
without any land use control. They really had no control over ultimately what would be built on a site if it's private, privately owned. And so zoning changed all that. Um, you know what zoning is. The, um, this map is a town of Ithaca. It surrounds the city of Ithaca. You know, zoning establishes and locates different zones in a community. Each zone allows different uses, um, might have different setbacks, different minimum lot sizes, and so on. Also regulates other features of a site, like parking, signs, landscaping, hopefully architecture, although it's not that case in every community, lighting, and so on. Um, there are some shortcomings to conventional zoning. It is better than nothing, but conventional zoning tends to focus more on what a community doesn't want than what it does want. Um, a lot of the basic zoning codes that many rural communities have or some of the older codes that are still in use, um, they really just regulate the basics. That is, here's our setbacks, here's the uses we allow. Here by right, here's the uses we allow by special review. There might be, you know, there's sign regulations, basic parking regulations but it's not that great at making a specific type of place. Um, it really does emphasize function over form. Um, the emphasis is on lot size and setbacks and there is a one size fits all kind of pro problem where you know, this image here, this is a site that passed by in Florida when I was down there last week. And it's in the middle of this small towns downtown uh, prime location, but what's on there, it's an ice vending machine and it's prime real estate. And really it's going to waste because with, you know, very, a very, um, let's say, you know, very few improvements, something that a municipality can't tax, that people won't really come down and visit. That doesn't add to the vitality of a place. Um, Another example, this is in Tonawanda, New York. There's a, an intersection where you've got about 60,000 cars that go by every day. And back in the 1950s, it was considered prime real estate. What's there now? An ATM machine. So really, that was one of the concerns of zoning, of the early practitioners or the early proponents of zoning was that without it, land would be wasted. But sometimes if you don't, if um, conventional zoning will, with it, when you're just paying attention to the basics, when you don't have any fine grain tuning over what's going on with the property, you might end up with a lowest common denominator use that does waste, waste land. Um, also conventional zoning focuses on separating different uses and development intensities. So here's a scene outside of Amherst, New York, suburb of Buffalo. And we've got all these little clusters of residential development. Got patio home, a patio home cluster, single family cluster on 10,000 square foot lots, another on slightly bigger lots. We have an apartment complex and none of them are interconnected. Each one sees the other in a way, but really more the higher density the lower density developments, um, many codes treat the higher density developments as if they're nuisances to those low de density developments. If you're trying to create a neighborhood, that kind of zoning really isn't going, going to work. Um, Am you go to Amherst and the streets aren't that wide. You're going to have tree lawns. You've got sidewalks on both sides of the street, but Ultimately, they're not coming together to make something that's a whole that's bigger than the sum of the parts. You just have a lot of little pods that are connected by an interior, by an arterial road. Yep, conventional zoning beats no zoning. Um, I'm not saying that conventional zoning, because it has these shortcomings, go out and scrap it. Because if you do, well, here's a scene outside of Austin, Texas, in you know, unincorporated Travis County, Texas counties can't have zoning by law. And this is what happens. And this was a lower income residential development that got infiltrated with very like nuisance with 
nuisance type uses through the years with a lot of auto repair, auto storage, uh, body shops, and so on. So just like the 1910s, you have a family that saves up, they buy a house and the only place they can afford. And then, you know, you have you know, a junkyard move next door and there goes your investment. Um, I'm just going to see if you're paying attention right now. So let's see. Oh, oh, okay. Good. Okay. I can have you looking. Let's talk about form-based zoning a little bit. Um, some more holistic way of placemaking. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit more later on about some of the differences between form-based zoning and conventional zoning. But really form-based zoning, I think, sees the bigger picture a little bit better than conventional zoning. Um, let's go here. It allows really rather than the pods, it allows different but compatible uses, buildings, whatnot in the same zone. In the same zone, this is kind of an example from Buffalo, Elmwood Avenue, where you have a house next to a commercial building and really, you know, they're not out of place. They, they're compatible. Um, you shape the private realm to create a great public realm. I think that's when um, conventional zoning really doesn't look at the public realm. You might have some codes, unified development codes that will have standards for, for streets, sidewalks, and so on. But I'd say in the majority of communities that are out there in America, you're going to have separate zoning codes, separate subdivision codes that might have the street standards in them. And there's really not a connection between the two. So the zoning really doesn't think about what the public realm looks like. When I say public realm, talk about streets, sidewalks, parks. The new urbanist crowd likes to talk about, they say is a common living room, that the street is a great public place. It's um, really something that's meant for all of us. It's a third place for people. Um, Form-based zoning ensures that different parts fit in to create a better whole. So rather than saying all of the green red blocks have to go over here, all the green blocks have to go over here, you're allowed to mix and match to some extent as long as it's compatible and as long as the result creates a better whole. And the form-based code has, in a way, the, the regulations have kind of a, a recipe of sorts that help you get there. Okay. You go on. I even say a brief analogy. Conventional zoning, just regulate. Let's say you've got this R40 zoning district. Conventional zoning is just going to say what the setbacks are, what the building height is, um, what uses you can have, and that's it. Form based zoning for a zone regulates things a little bit differently. Um, you, most form based codes will a lot will have will define a certain number of zones, just like conventional zoning. However, it regulates what you can build on a building by building level. There might be a list of building types, let's say like set single family house, duplex and so on, all the way on up to commercial buildings. Um, it allows certain number, certain types of building types in a, sink, in a zone so one zone might allow single family houses, duplexes, townhouses. The next zone up might allow that plus small apartment buildings and so on, all the way on up to a downtown. Um, it has, it regulates the height setback of each of those building types individually and regulates them like they're different for each zone. So the setback for for instance, for side yard setback for a cottage might be a little bit narrower in that R40 zoning district than for a larger single family house. Um, same, you know, and again, what the, the setbacks for each of those might change in the zones that they're, they're allowed in. I'm going to talk about Ithaca a little bit, and I'm going to get back to form-based zoning, what it is, but 
town of Ithaca um, probably isn't that different than many other towns in New England. It's 30 square miles that surrounds the city of Ithaca. New York State doesn't have any unincorporated areas. Everything is either part of a city, a town, or a village. So we surround the city of Ithaca. Um, we've got the campus of Ithaca College and a large part of Cornell University's campus, both academic buildings and teaching farms, open space, and so on. In 2020, our population was 22,000, went up by, by about you know, 14, 15, 16,000 residents. Um, it's generally, if you subtract the students, it's generally a middle to upper middle class community with very high education levels. And that's because Ithaca's main industry is academia with of course Cornell and Ithaca College. Um, see, there's residential, that's the Ithaca College campus. We still have a lot of farmland in the town. Um, there is a disconnect though between what the town's pol planning policy is or at least was and the new normal, or say the new normal that came about probably in the late 1990s, early 2000s as lifestyles have changed. Our default zoning is a basic 1950s zoning code. We've had years and years and years of updates and patches. Um, there really hasn't been kind of the political will to replace that zoning code with the new code, despite all of its shortcomings, which we laid out in a zoning diagnostic we had um, several years ago. The planning policies in the code, they promote what was considered ideal development back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Low density residential development, our standard lot size is 15,000 square feet. That's what we call medium density residential, about 2.2 units an acre. Um, residential areas tend to have an exurban or semi-rural character. I live in the town of Ithaca and again, it's a large lot area. It's even though I'm promoting traditional neighborhood development, I do live in an area that is not very walkable, but sometimes that's a lot of planners are stuck in the same same boat because, and you know, we have a housing shortage, but I'll get to that in a bit. We do have extensive promotion of agricultural areas, open space, and there's very limited commercial development, which really has been a good thing because we don't have the we don't have that much in the way of you know obsolete you know 1970s 1980s shopping centers. We have one, but we have plans for redevelopment of that, which I'll get to. Um, another issue that we face, it's housing, 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 housing. Um, sometimes I like to say that where Ithaca is kind of a convergence of suck when it comes to housing, not just the city, the town, but the surrounding region, any of the forces that are out there, um, the market forces, government policies that contribute to expensive housing um, and not ensuring that there's an adequate supply for our growing population, it's here, unfortunately. And it's very difficult to get past that. Here's a, one example. This is kind of an extreme example. This is a house that's about two blocks away from me. One bedroom, two bathroom, one acre lot, and large lot zoning, 1200 square feet, and all together, everything came to $600,000 to build that. Um, and also, um, we do have, you know, Ithaca is known for having a very large counterculture. We're one of America's iconic college towns. And with that comes one of America's iconic hippie, town, hippie communities. And the countercultural movement has had kind of an outsized influence on both the local culture and planning. There's a lot of romantiz romanization of rural rustic living. There's a live and let live mindset that 
extends in some way to local government policies. There's a lot more concern in the past. Planning policies really focused more on the quality of the natural environment in some ways at the expense of the human environment. So people moved to Ithaca. They wanted to have, I say, they wanted to have their 10 acres, um, their biodiesel powered Volvo and their 2.5 goats. <laughs> they think, you know, if I was going to put it in like a kind of New England context, uh, Vermont. So <laughs> plan and other planning challenges are out there too. Like got fragmented lot ownership. This makes agglomerating land very difficult for building any kind of subdivisions or master plan communities. There is some NIMBY or drawbridge syndrome. People move here and then they don't want anybody else to follow them. Uh, planning culture in upstate New York it tends to have not invented here syndrome. And it's like really innovative concepts in planning tend to take a while before they reach New York State. And there seems to be, a, in many, many communities, there's the attitude that many progressive policies or progressive concepts that communities are doing, communities in Colorado, um, Southern states and so on, that they're not for us because we're small, we're not growing, and you know, because of New York. Um, there's also the perception that the town is a developer unfriendly place. And part of it does have to do with our very basic zoning that because it really just regulates the basics, a lot of, a lot of aspects of development are negotiated between the planner, between at the planning staff, um, the developer and the planning board. And so even though you have a zoning code that lays out setbacks, uses, height, and so on, the results um, can be unpredictable. There's a lot of uncertainty as to what might ultimately get built. And I think that leads to a lot of the NIMBY that's been out there is that development in the past, with a few exceptions, really hasn't been all that innovative. So, you know, that all changes though. Here's like a little sound. Um, with the 2014 comprehensive plan, our previous comprehensive plan was business as usual. That is low density suburban development, uh, preservation of rural land and so on. However, we recognize that there is a need for more diverse neighborhood settings and housing types. The city of Ithaca is approaching build out. Um, there, a lot of the surrounding communities don't have utilities or they don't have zoning. They don't have, they really don't have the capacity to accommodate anything more than large lot development. We do. So uh, we have sewer, we have water, and we have more than enough capacity to handle more growth and at least more intensive growth than what's happening in the town. So talk about traditional neighborhood development a little bit. Um, I think everybody who's watching this might have heard about traditional neighborhood development or new urbanism, although we've tried to avoid the U word. Um, compact setting, mix of uses. Um, basically, it's like building a new old village or a new old neighborhood. And our comp plan found three places, or we identified three places in the town that are ideal for TND. Um, in Ithaca, we talk about hills, East Hill, South Hill, West Hill. And areas on West Hill, South Hill, these are areas of greenfield and um, some developed land, underdeveloped land that is under contiguous ownership that has utility service and is actually viable, very close to the city, close to employment centers that we feel is viable for larger master plan, higher density communities. On East Hill, um, that's the area that's in red, that's on the far right side of the map. That's East, that's East Hill Plaza. That's an older shopping center from the 1970s. And Cornell University owns it. 
they've identified in their campus plan that land for a what they call a town center, um, basically traditional neighborhood development. We want to see it redevelop like sprawl repair is what planners call it. We want to see it redeveloped as well. Um, how do we sell the idea of traditional neighborhood development to a population that's really doubtful about it, that came to Ithaca to get away from it all, came from the big bad city, and it's that attitudes are changing. If you really love nature, if you really love the farms, you really love the wineries, you really love the open spaces, you love the gorges, the hills, don't live near them. Don't carve out an acre, five acres, 10 acres of it and make it your own. Save it for the next generation. That if you really believe in living, like if you really believe in having a lighter footprint on the land, don't take a big chunk of the open space that surrounds our town. Um, also, we had, during the time we were doing our comprehensive plan and afterwards, we had two smaller projects, planned unit developments, that were in a way TND light. Um, we had, you know, Bell Sherman Cottages, which is about nine units an acre. It's a mix of single family homes on small lots and townhouses. Then there's Maplewood, which is a graduate student housing complex on the site of a, a former old suburban scale apartment complex that was redeveloped in a in the form of a TND. And the reception to these projects has generally been positive. Not everybody likes them. I don't think you're going to get anybody to like everything. But once they became established, people came to appreciate them, I think. Now, how do we implement our comprehensive plan, which wants to see traditional neighborhood development, yet we've got this old zoning code that really promotes suburban development, and it's very difficult to retrofit anything into that code. We came up with the idea, let's do a second zoning code in a way. And this is how many communities have form-based zoning. They have it as a supplement to an existing conventional code that we call it the new neighborhood code because it's intended for just these new neighborhoods, allows traditional neighborhood development. And in those areas that the town identified in the comprehensive plan for, for T&D, higher density development, and wrote it in-house. We didn't hire consultants. We did have another local planner and a prominent urbanist who sat on our, what we call our TND committee to review drafts of the code and suggest ideas as drafts came out. But otherwise it was written entirely in-house. Most of the graphics were done in-house. We did it ourselves. And I think you can do it too. So what does the new neighborhood code do? Like any form-based code, we focus on the overall character and physical form. There's that image again, considers what works well together. Again, same image. We have, because it's a, it's a much different approach, form-based zoning than conventional zoning. When I wrote the code, wanted to have it be as easy to understand as possible. Um, because it's going to be elected officials are going to be looking at it, lay people, planning board members, um, building staff, and they're used to conventional zoning codes. Um, so how do we make it easy to understand? Plain English. It's written in a way where I ran it through Microsoft Word grammar checker over and over and over and got it down to a ninth grade reading level. There's no legalese in it. No, the aforementioned set, setback shall here and after be 25 feet. Yeah. It's plain English, um, no passive voice, active voice. We use tables and short lists, um, lots of graphics, lots of photos, all the graphics we made um, with SketchUp in-house. There's how-to guides at the start of every chapter that tell you how 
the chap how the regulations in that chapter work. And we do have prescriptive rules, which, um, but they are flexible and that allows more predictable decision making and outcomes that are a lot more certain. So there's very little that's left open to negotiation in the code, at least on a site by site basis. If you comply with the code, you plan something that complies with it, um, odds are it's not going to need the higher ups, um, planning board, town board aren't going, they really aren't going to require too many changes for it to, to pass. Um, town board had a good close look at this. Everybody um, planning board looked at it and they were all happy with the, with the regulations that were in the code. So there's going to be less, um, probably less negotiation, less of that uncertainty when it comes to development. The code's laid out by topic and scale of land use. So part of this is to avoid page flipping. And if you're looking at one area, like let's say you're looking at designing a neighborhood, you only have to look at sections two and three. That is, what are the zones? How to design the neighborhood? That is, laying out the street, the streets, the zones, and so on. If you're building a house, really, you just look at four and five. You don't have to look at any of the other other chapters. And this way it makes the code easy to use because it's in little di easily digestible bits. All those pieces, all those little parts of the code are all independent, um, but they do work together again to create a neighbor, create a larger neighborhood. Um, again, this is an image that you'll probably see a lot if you're looking at form-based codes, traditional neighborhood development, anything in planning starting from about 20 years ago on up. So the, the new neighborhood code, we're promoting development, allowing development in what planners will say is the T3 or T5 range. Even though it says suburban, it really is more of a streetcar suburb than a large lot suburb, all the way on up to T5 and urban center not necessarily a T6 downtown. You see T1 natural, T2 rural zones. We already have conventional zoning that covers those areas. So we've got four new zones that the new neighborhood code creates. NT3, neighborhood transect three, that's the neighborhood edge. That's primarily detached residential buildings. NT4, neighborhood general, a mix of detached and attached residential buildings. NT4U, which is an urban mix, which allows some storefront commercial uses. Um, otherwise, it's much like NT4. NT5, neighborhood center, that's your main street. So storefronts, apartments above, and so on. So the, a regulate, um, regulating plan, talk, talk on that a little bit more later, is what rezones the underlying land for TND. So regulating plan is much like a master plan, shows where the streets go, um, where the zones are, what the street types are and so on. But you don't necessarily need a regulating plan if you have form-based zoning. A lot of communities adopt form-based zoning for existing areas to try to preserve or reinforce the character of an area. Um, town of Ithaca, we're doing it to make new neighborhoods and for our redevelopment of um, Grayfield sites. So first chapter, when we talk about neighborhood development, neighborhood design, it deals with the mix of zones for the neighborhood location. It is like on West Hill, which is further away from Cornell University, further away from Ithaca College, looking at more NT3, less NT5. The more, the closer you get to an employment center, like South Hill, East Hill, the code allows more of those intensive uses and you don't need as many of the less intensive uses. There's also requirements for thoroughfares and streets, um, much like what you'd see in a subdivision code. How long is the block going to be? Um, it doesn't allow cul-de-sacs except um, if there's no other way to reach part of a parcel or development site. Otherwise, all the streets have to interconnect. Blocks have to be short. Um, 
you have to have alleys on the internal blocks outside of the NT3 zone. Have you also requirements for utilities and basic requirements for stormwater management. Stormwater management, um, it's a big issue in New York State. Also, Ithaca, we have hard clay soils. Um, it's not of the, the area doesn't drain that well. Um, all the factors that go into creating great wine when it comes to soils really doesn't work for, um, it's not very good for drainage. So what we're, we're writing a separate stormwater guide for TND that's more of an advisory guide on how to do stormwater management. In New York State, any development has to meet the state stormwater management laws, but they are written with suburban development in mind. So the guide that we're writing describes how to approach stormwater management from a more urban built up perspective. And let me go on. So there's stand, when you're talking about laying out streets, there are standards for the block pattern and it, how long is a how long is a block, one side of it, what's the radius or rather the distance around a block, connectivity, street alignment, street types. We define five different street types. Again, this is to make the code easy for lay people to understand. Pedestrians, it starts off with a pedestrian street. Really, it's a street without cars, um, although you are going to have alley access. Then there's the alley, a yield street, which is a narrow residential street, local street through street. And there's different requirements when it comes to the roadway, um, the width of the tree lawn, type of tree lawn, and width of a sidewalk. And the code also requires that streets are complete streets, is that any they're safe for all users, whether you're on foot or behind, behind the wheel. For example, here's a yield street. Um, a TND street is going to be more finished than a typical road in the town. A typical residential street in Ithaca is going to be have a, is going to have a rural profile. Um, you're going to have the roadway, a shoulder, a ditch, no sidewalks, no tree lawn. This code changes that, so it is a there is going to be a learning curve for our public works department and really for anybody who's building a street um, because most new streets outside of the city of Ithaca, whether it's the town of Ithaca or one of the other suburban communities, they tend to have rural profiles. Parks, um, neighborhoods have to uh, have, to have um, 15 percent parkland. Uh, at least 15% parkland, 10% parkland if we're talking about the denser East Hill area. Um, the code defines different types of parks. It requires that a every building lot has to be within a thousand feet of a park or five minute walk, and that parks have to be prominent and part of the public realm. It defines for different park types what percentage of the perimeter of the park has to front on a street. And one again, one reason for doing that is that parks are part of the public realm. They're for everybody. Um, Ithaca, like many other communities, for a lot of cluster development in the past, parks have been hidden behind lots. And they take on kind of a private air that anybody who uses those parks feels like they're intruding in somebody's backyard. People who live next to those parks don't like anybody back there using them. So this changes all that, returns parks to the public realm. Um, this is the key, one of the main differences between how a form-based code and a conventional code regulates what you can do, what you can build rather, and it's with building and lot types. So the new neighborhood code, we find 17 different lot types. Um, so those lot types, you know, one is a non-building lot, otherwise they have different building types, you know, one family residential, duplex, paired house, townhouse, I won't go through them all. But 
each zone of our four zones allows a different mix of different building types. The setbacks for those different building types also vary from zone to zone and often vary from each other. And another key difference with form-based zoning is that you'll have, some, you'll have minimum and maximum setbacks. So you don't see underdevelopment. If you're doing a commercial building on an NT5 lot, for instance, that building has to occupy a large portion of the frontage of the lot, the sidewalk. I think it's 80%. I have to look at the code to make sure. So, but here's an example of, that shows that's our table of permitted house types or building types from the new neighborhood code tells you just what the home the building types are and the zones where they're allowed. Um, how do you determine the setbacks? Their new urbanists call it calibrating. And you look at areas that neighborhoods, um, cities that have the type of character that you want to see in your community. And you try to reverse engineer it. You look at the DNA of it, see what makes this area tick. Often it's there, you're going to find some common elements in the building placement, building heights, and so on. So um, minimum and maximum setbacks said earlier, it varies depending on the zone. Um, you know, emphasize maximum setbacks. We also have minimum and maximum lot sizes for each of the different building types. And it allows a better custom fit of the buildings to their setting that you're not underbuilding or overbuilding for a lot in that the mix of different buildings combines to make a better whole. We have architectural regulations in the new neighborhood code too. And this is the first time that the town of Ithaca outside of planned unit development, if you could excuse me for one second. Okay, sorry about that that I'm going to speed it up a little bit, that we have standards for exterior materials, some building design elements, but we're not dictating individual style. We're just saying that the, the architectural elements that we've seen that, that really make, I think what people would call an ugly house, those are things that we're trying to zone out or an ugly commercial building, what have you, that you want um, some new urbanists will call this activation, that you want to have a building that responds to the street that it's on. You want to have a human scale that you don't want to just see one type of building material, blank walls, and so on. Um, there's also site improvement requirements. Um, this, this is the next layer down, or at least the next um, you know, kind of scale of development. And the regulations cover parking design, landscaping, fences and walls, service and utility areas, signs and landscaping. Then there's uses. And you'll sometimes hear people say that, other planners say that form-based codes doesn't really, um, either they don't regulate uses or they place a very low priority on regulating uses. And that's not necessarily true, but you're really looking more at regulating the built environment with a form-based code than what happens inside those buildings. Um, so also our existing zoning code, we have the long laundry list of uses. Um, you'll see, you know, the haberdashery and the telegraph office and the candy shop and, it reads just like what you would expect to see in a 1950s neighborhood. Um, most form-based codes tend to collapse those laundry lists of uses. They tend to be much less granular. So instead of all the little men's clothing store, women's clothing store, men's hat store, women's hat store, it's going to regulate just retail storefront uses, for instance. Um, then we have a sprawl repair section. This is one of the parts of the code that respond to one of the unique conditions that we have, and that's uh, at South Hill and East Hill, where there is some existing, some existing development. And the sprawl repair section, offered, you know, 
how would these neighborhoods redevelop over time? Because you you might have an old Burger King, old McDonald's, it becomes a non-conforming use, but how do you build around that and ultimately integrate those uses into a larger pedestrian oriented walkable neighborhood? Oh, let's see, okay. I didn't quite see that, but here's master plan for a new neighborhood. Again, not every form-based code is going to have a regu going to involve regulating plans or master plans to build new neighborhoods. Some of them might involve existing neighborhoods, but the regulating plan is the planning process for zoning, designing a neighborhood, and it does involve the public. We do above a certain size, three acres, um, we require a design charrette where um, the public is involved, they offer their feedback and so on. Um, we might have our first TND, our first regulating plan this year uh, at South Hill. That um, This is a site that has several different owners, a couple of owners that own the two owners that own the majority of the land in the area. And then there's other, like there's frontage lots that range from about one acre on up to four acres. And the town plan paid for the consultant and the town is actually sponsoring the regulating plan because we want to see this develop as a unified neighborhood that it might be a little bit more difficult if it would, you couldn't create a coherent neighborhood if just one of the property owners, even though they might have a couple of hundred acres, if they planned independently of everybody else. But the planning process for the new neighborhood code does have the provision for that type of planning if in some case, if there's some case where other property owners just don't want to get on board. In this case, um, other property owners in that area are more or less receptive to the idea of being included as part of part of a traditional neighborhood development. And the advantages of the new neighborhood code and really form based zoning for us found that it's going to increase the choice of neighborhood settings and housing types that leads to lower environment, fewer environmental impacts. Um, it's going to help make middle market and entry level housing more viable. Um, creates critical mass that's going to support local businesses and, of course, more predictable decision-making and development outcomes. Okay, I'm not exactly seeing this change. I'm sorry. Here we go. Um, it's not perfect. We don't expect that the new neighborhood code or our form-based code is going to cure absolutely all the ills that a community might have. Um, we don't have the experience dealing with finished urban streets. Um, we don't have the we don't have the experience with urban forestry, um, home building in the area. We don't have any production home builders or spec home builders. It's mostly mom and pops. How do we get that to scale up? Construction costs are still going to be high. Um, property owners might need to partner with larger developers. And again, because Ithaca is a growing community, but it's Ithaca, New York. It's not Ithaca, Colorado. So the build out of these neighborhoods will take decades. It's not going to be an instant town overnight. And that's it. So get out of here and get back to the main screen. And I will let um, Anne take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. That's an amazing code, Dan. Really, that's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, if you can do your stop shared screen, I can see oh, if anybody. Okay. There yeah, we go. Okay. There we go. You would think um, after two years of doing Zoom presentations that I would know stop. Screen I know. Here. I <sighs> had to unmute myself the other. I know I forgot to unmute myself <laughs> the other day, and I mm. thought, really, am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a few people in attendance that have come on and I don't okay. know if anybody has any questions um but if you do you can use the the raise hand function to ask your question um one thing that I really like is um I love the concept of a design charrette 
for a larger project, you know, that whole regulating plan. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in communities that required certain neighborhood meetings for larger projects and things like that. And I think, you know, as Bangor looks at our larger, because really that's, you know, one of the focus of our comprehensive plan is we have some really large lots that could be developed mm -hmm. um, in our rural areas. And one of the questions we have for our residents is what do you, what do you want to see out there and what kind of development do you want to see? Um, and I really like the idea of, you know, of having applicants assemble, you know, neighborhoods to get together to talk about what should happen yeah. um, on some of these larger lots. Mm -hmm. That was a really, I love that idea. It's a great idea. I'm glad that, you know, our town board, they had the foresight to budget the to like give us the budget to hire the consultant um and we decided that you know we didn't want to do a you know kind of a we didn't want to do a really a bad job um at this that so we hired a well-known nationally recognized consultant and yes it costs more but we know that the outcome is going to be a higher quality project and I think if we're going to sell the second TND, if we're going to have a second TND, we have to have the first one be a really fantastic place to, to live. Yeah, yeah. And the other um, takeaway that I wrote down was, I like the park requirement. Our subdivision, mm -hmm. you know, our just basic subdivision requirement has a requirement to dedicate a certain percentage of open space. and. You know, a lot of times it's just sort of this parcel that they couldn't, you know, the whoever designed the roads, it was just kind mm -hmm. of leftover land or mm -hmm. something like that. And, um, you know, now we're seeing a lot of those that were done. People, the developers are coming back saying, can I turn this into a lot? Can I switch this <laughs> out? And, you know, they were. So it's nice. I like the idea of putting in more direction about that dedication of park that you know there's some spec to it where you have to you know has to have frontage it has to you know right. mean something right and there are requirements or at least there's a guide for what lands need to oh, a priority for what lands should be in open space and you right. said we have that issue under our conventional zoning that Ten, we've got a 10% land dedicate, open space dedication in our existing conventional zoning. For some of the very small subdivisions, they do a, you know, they'll pay a fee in lieu of dedicating land. Um, I live in a subdivision where they actually did the land dedication, and there's an undeveloped park behind my house that is unmowed, um, no trails, almost no access. It's really just an extension of my backyard. And it's something that really doesn't benefit the community at large. So in a way, the town has subsidized my backyard. Um, <laughs> in a way, I'm not paying taxes on it. Um, you know, sure, I don't own it, but uh, it's a town subsidy for me, and that's really not fair. Yeah. I know it's funny. I grew up um, in a suburb of Syracuse, New York, and in a subdivision mm -hmm. that was built in the mid 50s. Mm -hmm. And the developers, hundreds and hundreds of lots created. Mm -hmm. And the developer actually built a school, a grammar oh, school, wow. as his dedication of open space. And wow. You know, and the place sold like crazy because oh, yeah. you could walk to school. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, it was, was right in the deal. middle of it. That was a big yeah. deal, right? You know, baby boom and everybody having three or yeah. four kids. And of course, having yeah. a school right nearby, especially a, you know, good suburban school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a big selling point for folks. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. It was. So you know, now we, you know, we need to look at things a little bit differently. And right. so, yeah. Yeah. And I was, when I was in Florida last week, took a trip to 
This was, um, God, I can't even think of the name of the development. Oh, Babcock Ranch. It's supposed to be the nation's first all solar um, master plan community. And they built a school for, and I've seen other very large TNDs where they've built, where the developers have built charter schools. Again, these are projects that are going to be on a much bigger scale than anything we're probably going to get in the town of Ithaca. Um, development here is slow. Um, family sizes are shrinking. And, you know, I, if, we have civic lots that are dedicated to even a community center. I would feel like it's, it's going to be a success. What's one thing that we don't require in the new neighborhood code is mandatory dedication of civic land. Uh, you do have to have park land, but not necessarily civic sites for community centers, um, you know, um, places of worship and so on. Because we're also right. finding, again, you know, decreased religiosity in the United States that there isn't the demand for right. the land, for the, for the church or synagogue in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, right. So if we get a community center, that's great. If not, at least it'll be a walkable neighborhood. So. Right. Hmm. Anya, did you have any questions? Um, I don't have questions. I, I do want to say, though, that was a really good presentation, and it's educational for me because I didn't know that much about form-based codes before, so, um, and also want to say I like the cats uh, in between. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your cat, I was watching your cat open the door behind you, so that's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> but I, I did want to say to our participants, um, we want to get an idea of whether you think this can be applied to Bangor and if we should try and incorporate this into our comprehensive plan. Um, so if anybody has any comments on that, feel free to raise your hand. Chris Dalton has got a comment. So you can go ahead, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation. That was great. Um, oh, I'm welcome. a lay person resident. I don't know anything about planning, but um, you know, I live in Little City and I look at this sort of stuff and I have a general sense of the nice neighborhoods of Bangor are things that could never be built today because the setbacks are crazy and right. whatnot, you know. Um, so I just look at this and see, gee, it would be nice if we had these kind of codes so that, you know, the newer neighborhoods built would be, you know, more like you know, Little City and Fairmount and Tree right. Streets and, you know, the walkable neighborhoods that we have. Um, one of the things that you see a lot around here, you know, sort of closer in neighborhoods is that like, whenever there's anything going on, like Halloween, everyone just sort of like oh, drives yeah. into town because yep. <laughs> you know, they need a neighborhood That's and right. they don't live in one. And so, you know, I, I think it would be great if Bangor made it possible to, you know, build these kind of neighborhoods. Yeah, I saw an article not too long ago that talked about how you can design for trick or treating. And yeah. in Ithaca, we have a neighborhood called Fall Creek, and it's just north of downtown. It's the old, and you know, an old neighborhood laid out in blocks. It's a mix of single family homes, a couple of apartment buildings, some duplexes, and everybody goes there for the best trick-or-treating they don't go to the rich neighborhoods they all go to fall creek and i think yeah i think you know what you brought up it's something that you know other other planners other urbanists have commented on i think that's a fantastic observation and you can have that with a form-based code if you again calibrate the code to a neighborhood that you like if you see an old neighborhood in Bangor or Portland or wherever that you think that this is a great place. There's something good about how this feels. Um, get out the measuring tape. Look at how far back the homes are from the sidewalk. Look at the tree lawns. Um, try to reverse engineer it and see what makes it tick and then put it in your code. I like that. Reverse engineering planning. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it's good. Uh, and I love uh, the, the Halloween filter. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> uh, Dominic's got a question. Go ahead, Dominic. 
Thank you. Good evening. And I just, first of all, also wanted to thank you very much, Dan, for being here tonight. I really enjoyed the presentation and there's so much information and it's very exciting to see this. And yes, I want it all, you know, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, and I also live in a little city as well in Bangor, walkable mm -hmm. neighborhood, uh, which is lovely. And I would love to reproduce this neighborhood. Um, I guess one question, and forgive me because I am a novice and I <laughs> a nerd who enjoys this stuff. Um, the NT3, I don't want to call it the zone or neighborhood, right. is detached, sing, uh, detached housing. That's not necessarily exclusive to a, a single family housing, or is it? Or is it like uh, up to a certain amount of units? It's mainly detached, single family, duplex, and what we call, what I've seen called paired houses, or really a duplex where each half, if you're looking at a side by side duplex, is owned by a different property owner. Um, and also allows like accessory dwelling units mm -hmm. as well as a single as well but lots um single family that we had to find two types of single family houses there's just the regular detached house and then there's a cottage cottage is any house that's under 1500 square feet and we allow much smaller lots much smaller setbacks for that so um, in a way, right now, with our minimum lot sizes of 15,000 square feet, building a 1,500 square foot house doesn't make much sense. Um, people have done that, but people end up spending a hundred, hundred twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars to buy the lot, and then they spend a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars on improvements for that lot, and for them, it just doesn't make much sense. And um, we do have the NT4, which is, again, wide variety, both detached and attached, but not necessarily apartment buildings. And I think, you know, we're, I think most of the neighborhoods, we can allow you know, more NT4 than NT3 if somebody wants to do it. It's just having that right mix, though, that for the different zones, we allow different ranges and different parts of town. So I, I, can't, I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head, but let's say the NT3, the code might allow 40% to 60% NT3 in a T&D and then allow maybe, you know, like 30% to 50% NT4 and so on. So we're still getting that mix of multifamily close to single family and duplex um that multifamily isn't going to be shoved away in a complex somewhere great uh thank you i do have another question if it's okay um, yeah absolutely um bangor had i was part of the uh, housing group that we did a few years ago a small part i was like an observer and you know okay. anyway um my, and currently we're making adjustments to our, I'm hoping to make some adjustments to our zoning right now. And we're currently talking about, and I'm glad to see we're having a public planning board is gonna be doing a public meeting for this, for bed and breakfast and also boarding houses. So mm -hmm. with a form-based code, it sounds like it's more concerned, well, are there, is there a breakdown of what you can allow in certain districts or the and you know the NTs or the I mean yeah what do you allow for all the 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 city um as you said we I've seen you know you show that where there's commercial and mixed uh you know housing and commercial but what about things like bed and breakfast or boarding houses or rooming houses or you know things like that I mean is there a, a designation that that is written somewhere that is allowed in certain districts? Yeah, yeah. Um, bed and breakfast we define as a use, not necessarily a building type. And it's allowed in any zone. A What you're talking about as far as a boarding house, we have a building type 
that we call a, I'm trying to think of the name of the building type. It's funny because writing the code and I don't remember absolutely everything from it, but the co um, one of the building types is to allows um, up to really, you know, up to 10 people to live in the house that are unrelated. So it's a, trying to think of the name of the building type, but it's, you know, it's a much larger version of the single family house and that's allowed in an NT4 zone. Um, we put the limit on 10 because again, we're a college town and there's always concern about um, having a code that would allow too much, let's say um, purpose-built student housing or fraternity, sorority, whatnot really trying to provide, at least in the residential areas, more housing for local residents, um, not necessarily the college crowd. That doesn't mean somebody, uh, college students can't live there, of course, but we're trying to discourage that. But the idea of the house that can have up to 10 people, really co called a co-living house. And it's a trend that you're seeing I think it started in San Francisco, although it's probably always been around, but it also goes back a long time in the Ithaca area because we've had communes back in the 1960s and we've had urban communes of you know, groups of people that were unrelated that lived together and essentially functioned as a family, even though they don't meet the definition of that. And there's an idea of co-living for Let's say you know, we, we do have co-housing developments, but co-living is a little bit different because you're living under one roof, but possibly sharing a living space, sharing a kitchen, um, some common rooms, but these aren't necessarily fully self-contained units for all the different households that would live in the house. And there's been some demand for that. Um, senior citizens, now you're starting to see, looking at more of a co-living environment. They wanna look at co-living where instead of assisted living or a larger nursing home where they can live among their peers, um, have that support, but they don't want to be isolated in their apartment in a complex with a lot of other senior citizens. They wanna be in a neighborhood that's mixed and vibrant. So that's another way, but it does allow for that. Um, for a boarding house, like an SRO, um, the new neighborhood code really doesn't allow that. Hmm. So. That's interesting there. Okay, well, thank you. And also I, what I do like also, just for the Bangor question is where, and if we're interested, I like this, the sprawl repair. Oh yeah. <laughs> The Bangor Mall and the Broadway shopping mall area, which I live, oh, yeah. yeah, would certainly be great candidates uh, for for that. Right. And, uh, and I do like the architectural regulation too. I'd like to hear more about it. Maybe not now, but like read more as we discuss it. If we discuss it, what okay. that entails. But that's very interesting to me because it, uh, there is that fear. And yes, I want to be open to allowing different housing types in this neighborhood, but I do want to, I want it to be somewhat, uh, hey, I, I would like it to fit in somehow with the neighborhood uh, because the neighborhood, as Chris said, is a wonderful neighborhood. And Bangor, I think, has always had these nice neighborhoods and I would hate to see changes that would disrupt them in a negative way. Right. I think, you know, they are starting to see like there's two different approaches to architectural regulations that you that you might encounter among planners in the urbanist crowd. Um, I'm belong to the school of when you're building a place, you're building it for the future. It's there. Going, the houses are going to be there for if a frame house in the northeast is going to be there for. Up, you can have it be up to like 200, 250 years, but at least 100 years, it'll be, it'll remain viable. Um, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So you might as well design to make the place attractive, to make it someplace that people want to live because it's good looking. Um, 
I think it, um, all too often it seems like people, um, many who are concerned about the natural environment um, don't think about the visual environment as well. That is, you know, sure you're thinking about air pollution, thinking about sound pollution, light pollution, all that is very important. But visual pollution is also part of it. Um, the second school um, that you're starting to see, mainly among younger urbanists, younger planners, is that we need housing at any cost and it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what a building looks like. Have a McDonald's look like a McDonald's because at least it's honest and authentic. Don't design it to um, look like it's some you know, variant of, uses some variant of the local vernacular because that's not authentic. I, I think that's, I, I um, I'll- That's a new one. Yeah, I, you're really seeing that among, I'd say mostly among uh, younger planners and um, I'll just say I disagree. <laughs> As a younger person, I also disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying all younger planners, but I'm starting to see that more. So wow, okay. Don't say okay, boomer. Say okay, Xer. <laughs> so. That's right. <laughs> um, any other question? Oh, looks like Anne Marie has a question. Okay, cool. Anne Marie, you can go ahead. This is a more general question. Okay. But it seems to me that uh, it's going to be very important to get people to want to live in the city. Right. I mean, there are so many houses just outside of town that are, have been sold, built and sold, while houses in the town often are bypassed. Yeah. How do we plan? in such a way that people are going to want to live in the city rather than outside of it in a suburban area? Provide the housing that they want. Um, I think a lot of times inner city housing, and this is an issue that we really don't have in Ithaca. Um, again, you know, we're a suburban community. We really don't have any dense neighborhoods except for one hamlet that dates back to the late 1700s. Um, the city of Ithaca, there's a lot of functionally obsolete housing, um, gabled L houses, their frame that, um, close to 150, 160 years old, awkward floor plans, very low ceilings, and there's bidding wars for those houses. Part of it is because we have such a housing shortage that those older houses remain viable much longer on the market. So people are buying anything that they can get. The other thing is that, again, because of our culture, people, some residents, some home buyers don't mind that. They might actually seek out something that they call you know, quirky or with character. Um, in many other cities, a home with those kinds of flaws, um, folks are going to respond like, somebody on house hunters and like, oh my God, the bathroom is off the kitchen. No, anything like that. So um, take a look at those houses, take a look at those neighborhoods and see what do they offer and um, maybe provide some opportunities for infill in that area. Maybe the housing stock is obsolete, but if there's historic value in those neighborhoods that you want to keep, calibrate your code, calibrate those architectural regulations so that you have something that, oh, excuse me for a second, I have a kitty cat that's begging. <laughs> calibrate those regulations so that whatever character you have in that neighborhood, new development in the future continues it, honors it, respects it. So, but as far as getting people to move back into the city, that's something that planners have been trying to, oh, a question planners have been trying to answer uh, since really as long as a planning profession has been around. And yeah. so, I mean, if I'd really have to see the neighborhoods to, to know more. Yeah. Okay, and I do cool. think it, it's uh, anecdotal, but I do think, though, you know, the realtors have 
indicated that the downtown neighborhoods do sell quickly, that yeah. things come on the market and are gone that same day. Um, so I do, you know, because that's where some of the affordability, if you're in a home buying situation, not a rental situation, if you, if you can afford to purchase, um, you know, there are still some affordable homes in the downtown right. neighborhoods for people. Yeah. Same thing to- with like a, yeah, I have to say too that I think it's partly a generational thing. And I do think younger people in general want to live in the city. Um, I live in a downtown neighborhood uh, and I like being able to walk to work and walk downtown. And a lot of young people kind of think similarly. So right. I think it might start to change. Absolutely. Yeah. That's good Absolutely. news. And we're seeing that in the we're seeing that in Ithaca too. Um that again, you know, our demographics right now are very boomer oriented, but there's a large population of millennials, of um, Zoomers that stay in Ithaca after they get out of school or they move to Ithaca because, you know, they don't, you know, they like the vibe here. They kind of, you know, they're into the outdoors, whatnot, and they're looking for more urban living too. So it's, I think that the I, there's still people who do want to live in the suburbs. They want their land. They want some people that still want to have their goats or their garden. But I think that really that really is changing. Um, that has changed <laughs> more. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anne Marie. Any you. other thoughts? Dominic, you still have your hand up. Did you have another comment? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't take it down. <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. I just didn't want right, to. Right. But since, but since I'm here, I, again, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Dan a lot. And I've been to Ithaca oh, in my life with my partner, and it's beautiful. It's a lovely uh, community. And look, for, my brother lives in Binghamton, so I hope we okay. hope to it again. And I love the cats. And well, thank you. <laughs> So uh, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Dom. Yeah, that's great. So um, next week, where the topic is going to be green infrastructure. Um, and uh, any other any other comments, Anya? I don't have anything. I just want to thank Dan again. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, thank you so much. I really oh, appreciate thank you. this. Thank you, everybody. I would say, you know, if you have any more questions, uh, forward them on to the fine folks at the Bangor Planning Department, and they'll sure bounce will. them to me. And pardon me, we sure will. <laughs> and I'll I'll get back. So thank you. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good evening, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Have a good night.